All right. We, uh, the Committee on Parole, we are reconvening. We're at Southwest Transitional Work Program on Thursday, July 27th, 2023. Uh, with the staff there at uh, the facility, please introduce yourself for the record. This is Connie, an admin. Okay. And we have before us Mr. Williams. Yes, ma'am. Michael Williams. Michael, can you introduce yourself to the parole panel? Tell us your name and DOC number. Michael Williams, DOC number 715-166. Stand by one second. Can y'all fix that? It keeps swapping. Okay. <clears throat> Mr. Williams, you're classified as a second felony offender currently serving a 24-year sentence for simple burglary and unauthorized use of a motor vehicle. You have a parole eligibility date, which was November 6, 2022. Your good time release date is January 16, 2025. Does that sound accurate? Yeah. All right. Your case this morning has been assigned to Mrs. Jackson. Would you answer the questions? Good morning. Good morning. How are you doing? I'm doing good, and you? Fine, thank you. I have, your case has been assigned to me, so we're going to talk about the crime, talk about you, and um, talk about going forward. How old are you, Mr. Williams? 26. And how long have you been incarcerated on this case? Six and a half. That's what I'm showing. Uh, you originally got probation. Well, Did you originally get probation on the charge? Yes, ma'am. And how long were you on probation before you got that new arrest for unauthorized use of a motor vehicle? I'm on five years probation. I know, Greg. But your probation got revoked, correct? Yes, ma'am. I violated when I came back. Stop talking. Listen to me. You got placed on probation for those two burglaries, right? Yes, ma'am. And you had, according to what I see, you had only been on probation for three months before you got the new charge. Is that correct? Um, about right, you've been on probation for about three months, and then you got the unauthorized use of a movable that you got uh, five years on, and they revoked your probation on the burglaries. All right, I got the um, probation charge in 15. I, I took probation in 16, came back in 17. Oh, okay, you say came back. Why did you come back? Moving fast, I was still young. Because you were still, you got another charge. That's why you came back. Right. And that was the unauthorized use of a movable. Right. That's what I'm trying to ask you, and you're not, either not listening or not understanding. When you got these burglaries, you got placed on probation, and that probation got revoked because you got a new arrest. And you hadn't been on probation very long before you picked up the new charge. Can we agree on that? Yes, ma'am. So you only pled guilty to two counts of burglary but it's alleged that you and a group of individuals were breaking into vehicles and stealing uh, what was in the cars, and you were actually uh, arrested for 63 counts of burglary, but you ended up pleading guilty only to two counts. Is that correct? Yeah, ma'am. What's the Tada gang? Ma'am. Can you not hear me? I can hear the name you said. Tada, T-A-D-A-H, gang. Taylor, that's one of my little friends that got killed. Okay, and so, you, and so what does that got to do with you all breaking in the cars? Well, they were just, just young. They really had nothing to do with, do with him. Like, it was just, we were just young. It was just the name we was going by. Okay, so yeah. It was, how many of you all were in the group going around breaking in the cars? 
back then it was like a few, it was a lot of us. We call a lot. A lot, say about like say about fifteen at the most. And why were y'all doing it? We ain't had no reason. Okay. Uh, why weren't you working or in school? I had came out from boot camp. I went to St. Paul, and that's the GD school. And I had got put out of there. So like, I ain't never thought about going back at that time. So why did you get put out? I don't know. It was so long, I can't remember. Well, you know, I'm going to tell you right now, Mr. Williams, you're not giving me a whole lot to work with you. You really aren't. Are you enrolled in any kind of programs right now? Yes, ma'am. Since I've been incarcerated, I took four classes. Risk, uh, risk management, thinking for a change, uh, parenting, and um, risk management for a change, parenting, and anger management. And what did you get out of thinking for a change? They gave me a uh, different, uh, what's that word, like a different, different look on life. Like, since I've been gone, I've been in jail since I was 18, 19. And since I've been incarcerated, like, I look at life totally differently. In what way? In a lot of ways, like, I'm, I'm losing people, you know what I'm saying? And it's been a hill, and ain't going on in here. You know what I'm saying? Well, I mean, I, I, I agree with that, but I'm, I'm trying to understand what you learned that would help you not to come back. Hang around the same people. People who I thought that was there for me, like friend wise, they ain't there. You know what I'm saying? I was out there behind somebody who wasn't out there for me, who ain't doing nothing for. Well, you, you, you were, you, you were behind them. They were also behind you because you were doing the same thing they were doing. They weren't responsible for you being out there doing that. That was your choice. Yeah, but we were blind. We was young. So you didn't know that it was wrong to break into people's cars and steal their stuff. All the time we think, all right, wrong. That time we was doing that, it was like that was cool. That was cool. Like, but as you get older and realize, like, when you go back on what you was doing, like, they ain't make no sense. I agree with that. You lost 210 days of good time. Why'd you lose so much good time? The first time, the first charge I got, the contraband charge. Oh, they was talking about some notes. I had some notes inside my bed. And the uh, second time, it was like, I can't remember the second, uh, the second right up I had. Remember the third one, should probably was like a, like a fight or something. But like, I wasn't really in, into the fight. I had two little partners that was fighting or whatever, and I came in and broke it up. So like on the camera, it was saying, it was making it seem like I swung into the fight or whatever. So they just came and got out less and, Locked us up together. Are you in work police? Yes, ma'am. You've been in work police? Yes, ma'am. How long have you been in work police? I've been in work release like six months. And where do you work? I work at McDonald's in Mark Bluff and Lake Charles. Do you have a GED? No, ma'am. When I was getting my GED, when I've been incarcerated, they'll stop doing it. Like, they'll stop doing them, then they'll re restart them again. But how they was doing it, like, like when we used to write them, they already had a schedule made. So I ain't never fell in the schedule. Um, so ultimately, Mr. Williams, what's your plan for your life? Working. Doing what? What I'm doing now at McDonald's. I have a plan coming back on out here. And I'm in the process of trying to be a manager. Even even a manager at McDonald's doesn't make a lot of money. Sure. You live on that, really. Um, and what kind of... And who's in the room with you? Me, Connie, okay. working admin. Okay. Can you tell me what programs y'all offer up there? 
Um, well, they just started a uh, pipe pipe uh, fitting classes through Sowella Tech, and they have um, all, all different kinds. Well, I might need to know what oh, they are. Not just trade programs, but other programs as well. Um, I'm really not sure what you're asking. Like, what else? They, they offer GED classes here. Uh, stuff yeah, like that. taking thinking for a change what other programs like that do y'all uh what else should we offer besides just ged ged classes what other you've got uh the um well the pipe written and the culinary and re-entry re-entry re got uh substance abuse substance and, abuse uh, okay the cage range um, which is anger management. Yeah, anger management. He said he do, they have, do they have victim awareness? I believe so. I do believe that is one of the classes. Uh, you took, hold on, I'll find out. Let me find out. She's going to go get some more information. Victim awareness? Victim awareness, yeah. <clears throat> <clears throat> Thank you. Victim awareness is included in the reentry classes. Oh, okay, ma'am. I understand. I understand. Okay. Um, he is he in work release uh, at the choice of the institution or at his choice? Did they give you choices? No, I was everything. I know, but is there other choices that was given to you besides just here? You can work at McDonald's. Uh, uh, other choice. It was yeah. Well, I, I had somebody earlier who said that once they put you in work release, that's the institution's decision. You can't refuse work release. That's what I'm asking. Does he have the option of refusing work release? You didn't have no other option? No, not at the time. Probably no other options available. But you can talk to Mr. Walmart. And get into something else. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, that's a great problem. Yeah, they were going there. They had a lot of jobs were full. Oh, the other ones were full. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. But there, I mean, he could apply and talk to the man that's in charge of the jobs and stuff. Uh, okay, and I'm not so okay. I'm not so much interested in the job. It's the job working at McDonald's not it's not really gonna be doing much good. Instead of being in work release, he needs to be in some program. And he can't do that if he's in work release. So he needs to be in some program because he's got a lot of work on himself that needs to be done. And he can't do it if he's in work release. And that's what my question is. Instead of being in work release, can he be put in some of the programs that he needs to take in order to... Uh, you know, better. Yes. Okay, yes. that's all I need to know. Yes. Okay, that's all I have. And so, if if he works, he can still do programs, or yeah. would you do the programs full time? Yeah. No. Um, you can work and still do classes. Yeah. Okay. That's what we were trying to get at. Okay. <laughs> all right. Um, yeah. Question. We have some family. Some of your family, Mr. Williams, wants to speak on your behalf. We have Travis Judson, your brother-in-law, who wants to speak. Mr. Judson. How are you doing? Good. Tell us what you want us to know. I mean, basically, me and Mike have been talking a lot lately, and I can see the big change in him. And uh, 
I really would like him to come down and work with me, but he's been talking about that, you know, about his job out there in, in uh, Lake Charles and how he, he like it, want to become a manager and stuff like that. But I would love him to come back down here and be a manager out here for me. But, I mean, we talked, me, me and Michael talked a lot. We talked about how some of the guys that he was friends with, you know, they're not around no more. And like he said, he like he was telling me actually last week, like, hey, man, I thought a lot of these guys were my friends, you know, stuff like that. And life, life lesson, life lesson. I think he learned a lot. Yes, sir. And you're in Baton Rouge? Yes, I'm in Gonzales. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you, sir. And we have uh, Mrs. Tammy Matthews wants to speak. Yes, this is Tammy Matthews. Go ahead, ma'am. Um, I believe that my son is ready to come home. Uh, Michael um, has, to me, has shown me a tremendous change with himself and with life. And he do wants to do better. Yes, he has made some mistakes, as we all have done, you know, and we have to learn from them. Yes, Michael will do better. He will improve himself. He will continue his education as well as work. And I know that my son can do this here. No, he's not going to be affiliated with anyone because they are not around. And I just believe that we all are uh, is entitled for uh, the, you know, for second chances to be able to um, live our life and to do better and to show better. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for uh, your remarks. Mm -hmm. uh, Michael, is there anything you'd like to say to us before we vote? Um, no, man. Oh. Really, really just want to tell you, like, I'm just ready. I'm just ready to show y'all. Okay. We are ready to vote, Mrs. Jackson. Mike, you're still a young man. You're only 26 years old. Um, but I don't think you've matured to the same extent that you should be mature at 26 years old. I don't think you, you have the tools that you need to get out of this successful. And ultimately, that's what we want too. We want you to be successful. I don't want you to just get out and you know fall back into to old ways because you don't have the tools that you need to help you learn how to make better decisions. And I would suggest to your mom that you got us, you know, you were placed on probation. You weren't put in prison. That was your second chance when you got arrested and you had all those burglaries and they let you plead to two counts and you got placed on probation. You got a second chance and you blew it. You went out and you went back, same thing, messing with cars, with somebody's car. And there are consequences to actions. Yes, everybody makes mistakes, but everybody doesn't continue to commit criminal activity. But you need to grow up. You need to learn to understand um, yourself. You need to have some job skills. And you have the opportunity to be in programs that give you job skills that maybe you can make you know, $20 an hour. $25 an hour. That's what you should aspire to because even the manager of McDonald's doesn't make really enough money to live successfully. So you need to raise your expectations, raise your vision. I just don't think today is the day. I think you need to get into some more programs. You need a GED. You don't even have a GED. I don't think you're going to get to be a manager at McDonald's if you don't have a GED and you don't have the maturity to understand that yet. That's what I mean about you haven't grown up enough. You may want to be a manager, but without a GED, I doubt very seriously if you're going to get the opportunity to be elevated to that position. So while you're incarcerated, you need to take advantage of every opportunity 
every program that they have to equip you when you get out to be successful because that's what we want for you, success. So my vote today is to deny one because of your poor disciplinary history uh, since you've been incarcerated and you need more programming. So I'm gonna encourage you if you can and work release and do program, then do the program. But if it comes down to a choice between work release and the program, wisdom would dictate that you go with the program because those are the things that are going to help you when you get out. So that's my vote, Mr. Green. Okay, uh, Michael. Uh... My vote today would be to grant with a curfew from 10 to 6 a.m. unless it interferes with work and to obtain your GED. Okay, Michael. Um, <clears throat> my vote would also be to grant after you completed victim awareness in the pre 100 hours pre release. And then after release at special condition to work on the GED. You know, in your case, let me see. Yeah, right. Your vote would have to be unanimous, and that's because you don't have a GED. So you've received two votes to grant, one to deny. So today your parole has been denied. I encourage you to follow Mrs. Jackson's advice. You ask everybody, every staff member you see, what programs you can get into. Particularly the GED. All right. Good luck to you, sir. All right. Uh, yeah, I'm convinced Ms. Renata did that intentionally. That concludes our business there at Southwest. It's uh... she. Uh, she's she. She knew that he would get denied because he needed three votes if he didn't have his GED. And you, I think you could hear it in her. And when she says it, she said, oh, well, I'm gonna grant. And then she goes, oh, uh, actually, it looks like you need your GED. And they're kind of like just throwing it in his face over and over, you need a GED. You'll need a GED if you wanna be a manager at McDonald's. You'll need a GED if you wanna get paroled. You need a GED. They do love their GEDs here in Louisiana. Uh, but I, I've always said, what, what use is the GED, especially the, when they're asking people who are like 70s and they've been locked up for like 40 years and they're saying, did you get your GED? And the shadowing is awful. I am just trying to, I don't know. I got to figure out how to get the coloring right in this studio. I call it a studio. It's a room. Um, I don't know what to do. Maybe I'll get a green screen. Um, I'm gonna like mix this up with some, like l little hearings here and there, but I, I, you know, I tried to research his name. Problem is, it's a very popular name. A lot of things come up and after his crime. Did they say 68 arrests for, or is that 68 charges maybe for breaking? Basically, it's this gang that was breaking into cars, and I guess they just said, okay, you did all of them. I could be wrong on the number. It might have been 98. I, I just, it was a lot. And I guess there was some game he was involved in. And they touched on that for a second, but maybe for his safety, they stopped. I mean, I don't know. I thought even was it his brother that was talking about it? They're like, you got to be careful. He's still locked up. You know, you don't want anything airing on YouTube where he's speaking badly, right? I would guess that's not. But I, I mean, I agree with the. Uh, he's on work release, pretty good deal. I mean, that's kind of like one of the best, you know, he's seriously lucky that he was able to get that and uh, make the best of it. But I thought it was interesting that Miss Pernazzo was, oh no, it was Miss Jackson was putting down b being a manager at McDonald's. You know that? If that's his goal, then why not let him get his goal? Like, why put it down and say, you know, you, you're going to have a hard time making a living even doing that? I mean, it's to me, that seems a little bit, I just, like, if that's his goal, let him achieve his goal. No, I don't know. 
tell me I'm crazy. Uh, just, I don't know what options he has. Like, are you going to put him in, in, in programs to teach him how to weld? Is that something he wants to do? It just, it's not clear to me. Okay. So we'll do it. This one's a quick hearing. There's more background that I can go over though, after this hearing. So let's jump in. All right. Good morning. Would you introduce yourself? Tell us your name and DOC number, please. Uh oh, y'all are still on mute. There we go. Yes. My name is Elena Carmel. Um, and my DOC number is 750346. Thank you. Yes, from there. Tell us your DOC number again. Seven five zero three four six. Okay, so Ms. Tra Travella, you're classified as a first felony offender. You're currently serving a ten year sentence for possession with intent to distribute methamphetamine. You have uh, your parole eligibility date was uh, October 16, twenty twenty three, and your good time date is October fifteen, twenty twenty four. Does that sound correct? Yes, All right. Your case this morning has been assigned to Mrs. Jackson. Would you answer her questions? Good morning, Ms. Trevella. How are you? Good morning. I'm great. Good. Uh, let me ask you something. Um, do you have a federal detainer? Yes, ma'am. And um, what's the detainer for? Um, I've been sentenced to 15 years and the federal um to go to federal prison for what charges um conspiracy and uh felon with a firearm i believe that's what it is conspiracy to do what um to distribute drugs methods. and when and when have you actually been sentenced in federal court yes, when was that when was that when was your sentence you name i believe it was somewhere in October, maybe. And where did you go to federal court? Um, I went to downtown Shreveport to the okay. federal building. It yeah. might have been a little earlier. It was right before I went for state. It was like 10 days in between my my sentences here. Okay. So whenever you're released from here, you're going to immediately be taken into federal custody and you're not getting any credit on your federal sentence for um, the time you're in state custody. Is that correct? Um, I'm not for sure. Um, they didn't, didn't tell me any of that. Usually you don't. Sometimes you know, it's possible, but usually you don't. So your attorney didn't tell you anything about that? Um, I think that he did tell me something about maybe I can appeal for it. Um, and how, how long have you been in state custody on your current charges? Um, I've been down 25 months. And that was the result? of your uh, revocation for possession with intent to distribute math? Yes, ma'am. And where are you, uh, and you haven't had any classes or enrolled in any programs over the last 25 months? So I didn't see any in your file. No, ma'am. They didn't offer classes in my parish. And then when I've been here, I wrote to Miss Staten and asked to be assessed to be put placed in classes. And how long have you been where you are now? I've been in Tallulah for seven months. Okay. And in seven months, you weren't able to get in any programs? Um, no, ma'am. I wrote to her two times. She told me in the last five or six months, I believe. 
I'll be placed in the classes. All right. Uh, that's pretty much all I have, Ms. Travella. Can we see from this? All right. That's all I have. Ms. Uh, Ms. Jones, is there any input from the facility? Uh, no, ma'am. Anything you want to say to us, Ms. Travella, before we vote? Um, I did have a statement that I would like to read. Okay. Okay. I've been, um, I'm 41 years old. I've been incarcerated since June of 21. The past two years, I've spent reevaluating my life and the choices that I made that landed me here. I have renewed my relationship with the Lord and transformed my negative attitudes into a positive, sober, and happy on me. I realize now how my drug addiction negatively affected and literally destroyed my life as well as others. I spend time now reading my Bible and strive to be a better mother, grandmother, daughter, and sister. I still have to go to federal prison after I'm released from DOC and plan to continue to work on my relationship with the Lord and my family. I plan on release to get a job and be a better mother, grandmother, and a productive member of society. Where's your family today? Um, my dad is in New York, and my son is in Mississippi, and I have a sister in Shreveport. Do they know you were coming up for this hearing today? Yes, my sister said she was going to um, be here today. Uh, maybe she's watching on the YouTube. We didn't have any, um, <clears throat> any guests for you today. I was just curious as to why. Yeah, she said she was going to. I'm not for sure. She maybe couldn't take off of work or something. Yeah. Not quite for sure. I talked to her yesterday, and she said it was on for today. <laughs> so I'm not quite for sure why she's not here. Well, you do. I just was trying to get you do have contact with your immediate family. Yeah, I do see your father's uh, did did respond, and he's. I see he is in New York. Yeah, once I get ready to go home, he's gonna, he's my support right there. He's gonna make sure I do right and get get on my feet. Okay, I think we're prepared to vote, Mrs. Jackson. Okay. Uh, Ms. Trevella, my vote today is going to be to grant uh, your early release to the federal bank. Thank you. Mr. Brayden? I concur. My vote also is to grant to the federal detainer so you can go start working on that. Good luck to you. You've been granted to the detainer. Good luck. Thank you. Well, the moral of the story that I learned from this is don't do a crime that you can get charged both federally and by your state. Man, she has this, she, like, none of this time is going towards her federal time. They basically did her a favor and said, Oof, like, uh, we're just going to release you so you can start working on that federal time. Man, anyone else know more about that? That just sucks. So, also it sucks is, you know, she's doesn't, no family shows up for your parole hearing. You gotta say, there's a lot on the line. If they say no, you know that every year you're sitting in here is just, it's just wasting away because you still got all this time you need to start backing once you get out. And that's got to be a lot of stress. I mean, I thought she handled it great. So four defendants involved in trafficking conspiracy received sentences of over 68 years in federal prison. And so here's the list, including Alana. Um, she received 12 years, three months, followed by five years supervised release. So she only gets to start working on that. And I don't know if they have good time in federal, right? The coloring is bad. I don't know what to do. Let me see. If this helps at all. Not really, but whatever. I gotta figure something out, people. Okay, federal grand jury returned an indictment charging all four defendants for conspiracy to distribute and possess with intent to distribute this stuff. And each of them have pleaded guilty as charged. Felicia B. Walker, Alana M. Travella each also pleaded to possession of a firearm in furtherance of trafficking. In addition, five, five, 
five firearms were received. So funny. She like in this hearing, she seemed so like wouldn't hurt a fly, just like your everyday, you know, and here she is, like in this whole conspiracy with firearms and traffic. It's like crazy. Different two different people. According to evidence presented in the court beginning on about March 12, 2021, the U.S. Enforcement Administration began investigating the suspect trafficking activities of these defendants. The DEA was able to obtain approval to intercept phone calls. Agents intercepted phone calls between Walker, Felicia Walker, and others in which it discussed the, in which they discussed the purchase of sales of methamphetamine. And specifically, a call was intercepted by agents on June 14, 2021, wherein Walker discussed the shipment of this stuff via U. Okay, in the mail via UPS. I was going to say, is that USPS? Agents were able to no, but it wasn't. I was wondering if that was what got them on the federal charge. Agents were able to seize the package of approximately two, two kilograms. That's what I've always said. It's like, if you're going to do a crime, don't don't be cheap. Don't use USPS. You're only going to attack on federal charges. Pay FedEx, pay UPS, right? On June 10, 2021, agents intercepted a call where Frederick Walker arranged to distribute the stuff. Agents set up surveillance and monitored transactions after it was complete, conducted a traffic stop in the vehicle. The driver was indicted. Uh, a search of his vehicle resulted in the seizure. Approximately 500 gross grams of stuff was located wrapped in plastic inside. Is that a lot? 500 grams? I don't know. Dun, dun, dun. Officers located approximately 104, 1,042 gross grams of the devil's lettuce and 949 gross grams of the other very bad stuff. That's not the devil's lettuce. A Ruger 556, an assortment of magazines, including extended magazines, because why not add on more charges while you're at it? Ammunition, digital scales, and Felicia Walker admitted to agents during an interview that it would be mailed to her because apparently she did not know what an attorney was or her right to remain a silence is. It's, it does amaze me how, how so many criminals are completely clueless. Like how so many now there is a freakonomics thing to take into account. We only see the moron criminals because we, we watch <laughs> we watch their interrogations. The smart ones shut it down. So we have to take that into account. I do wonder what the actual data is, what percentage just get a lawyer right off the bat. Uh, so you know, in reality, we just don't know. But whenever someone does talk to the attorneys, it just blows my mind. It's like a lot of these people aren't that young. And there's so much available information out there today to know that you just don't do it. And yet they just still do it. And fine, because it puts them away. Not that they would ever get out of this, but I want, I just wonder how this became a federal thing because they're tra transporting it across state. But you know, it doesn't see how much is how much is five hundred. I mean, how much is nine hundred forty nine grams of nine hundred? Let's see what that value is. Nine hundred forty nine grams of. One gram would be 20 to four, three and a half grams would be, okay, it's really not clear. Uh, three and a half grams could be 20 to $40. Is that it? I mean, this just doesn't seem like a lot of money. But hey, they decided to do it, so they did it. Uh, all right, so we'll do the next hearing. Right 
right? This is the one that we're supposed to be doing. Yep. Emilio Pearl's call to order today is Tuesday, July 18th, 8.47 a.m. My name is Brennan Kelsey, along with me, Mr. Alan Roche, H.P. Freeman, staff support seat at DOC headquarters in Baton Rouge. Our remote location is the State Police Barracks. With staff and support, please introduce yourself. Please. Oh, Lisa Frazier on classification. Captain Pat Washington, Commander. All right, thank you. And I uh, see we have some uh, guests that'll speak at the appropriate time. It's like Carrie Myers, uh, Patrice Brown, Doris Henderson. <clears throat> we also have Daryl Miles who won't be speaking. <clears throat> All right, please introduce yourself. <clears throat> State your name and DOC number for the record. My name is Arthur D. Brown, 108347. All right, Arthur, you heard the introduction. We'll have a parole interview, ask you some questions. <laughs> to respond at the end, you can make a statement. We'll take a vote. You understand the process? Yes, sir. Arthur Brown, DOC number 108347. You are a second class offender, pro eligibility date 324 2023, good time date 10 5 2031, full term date 3 2082. Uh, first degree murder, 99 years and you had connotation of sense, is that right? Yes, sir. All right, would you please answer uh, Mr. Roche's question? Thank you, Mr. Kelsey. Good morning, Mr. Brown. How are you doing? Doing, doing fine. Thank you. And nice seeing you again. Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, Mr. Brown, I'm just gonna put some facts into the record. Uh, Mr. Brown, your car is 60 years old, is that correct? Yes, sir. And you're a second class felon, and you have a good time date of October 5th, 2031. And by virtue of a commutation of sentence, your parole date was March 24th, 2023. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Uh, you've been incarcerated 40 years as of March of this year, is that correct? Yes, sir. And you've been at the police state barracks since January 19, 2010. Yes, sir. Almost 13 and a half years. That's, that's correct. With zero tolerance for any shenanigans, you have survived 13 and a half years of doing exactly what you're supposed to do. Yes, sir. And what is your job at the barracks? I'm a baker at the uh, governor's mansion. Okay. And you burn 510 days of good time credit. Have you completed any programs since your board hearing? Since the board hearing, uh, we had uh, a legal class that was sponsored by the JCs. Uh, I completed that. Uh, JC is also sponsored a Gordon class. I completed that. And also, I got a, a certificate from the JCs for being one of the guys, one of the most consistent character at the barracks. Yeah. Your part in the hearing was on June, uh, in June of 2022, about uh, 14 months ago. And by a vote of four to one, the pawn board granted a recommendation for a commutation of sentence to 99 years with immediate parole eligibility. That recommendation was based upon a positive prison record, maturity and rehabilitation over 40 years, positive remarks, by the staff at the police, uh, state police barracks, excellent disciplinary uh, conduct. The last write up was in December of 1997. Is that still correct? Yes, sir. And the length of incarceration, you had a low risk assessment, and you had a good transition plan. On March 24th, 2023, 
that recommendation was reviewed, revetted, and signed by Governor John Bell Edwards, giving you a pro date of March 24, 2023. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Now, you do have opposition, and you still have that opposition that you had in the pardon hearing. Opposition comes from the judge of the first JDC, the district attorney's office in Cattle Parish, <clears throat> the Cattle Parish Sheriff's Office, and the chief of police of Shreveport, Louisiana. <clears throat> All members, 100% of the victim's family members that responded to our request for a statement are adamantly opposed to your early release. And they also oppose your clemency, but they've also restated their opposition to your early release. Since your pardon hearing, you've taken great programs, you've had no disciplinary write-ups. So Captain Washington, do you have any comments, remarks, concerns, or observations? Uh, yes, sir. Thank you all. I'll be good stewards every time. Um, since meeting Mr. A.B., he has been the same person that you see before you. Very humble man, very um, about his business kind of person. And I would just like to comment, and I know how you are about the length of time that they're in one place. Being at the mansion for that long of a time, that's a statement. And and he is, when they found out that he was getting paroled, they got a little nervous. So um, I'm happy for him. I, I look forward to the things that are going to bless him in the future. And I just thank you all for your time. Thank you, Captain Washington. Uh, Mr. Kelsey? Okay. <clears throat> All right, we'll hear from uh, Kerry Myers now. Good morning. Uh, Kerry Myers with Louisiana Parole Project. Let the board know that Arthur Brown is a client of the Parole Project. We intend to uh, do everything we can and, and within our scope of our services uh, to help Mr. Brown transition after after 40 years of incarceration. Obviously, uh, as Mr. Roche stated, Mr. Brown has had a trusted position for a number of years. He hasn't had a disciplinary infraction in 25 years. Uh, he has been 13 years or, or more at the state police barracks. He works at the governor's mansion. Uh, there is, you know, Mr. Brown is, is now 60 years old. Uh, and, and by his record, by everything that he's shown, he's no threat to public safety. He has a, he has a very strong reentry plan. He has a very strong long-term plan. We just have to support him. All right, thank you. <clears throat> now we're here for Mr. Norris Henderson. Uh, good morning. Uh, I, I just want to kind of like really echo what Kerry just said about Arthur. I've been knowing Arthur for the whole 40 years and, I, you know, testified at his pardon board hearing. And I'm here to support him every step of the way, uh, along with Kerry and the parole project. All right, thank you. Uh, Ms. Patrice Brown. Yes, uh, this is Patrice Brown. Yes, I would like to uh, say that Arthur is in a position, as Carrie Myers and the other gentleman has already spoken, that uh, he will be an asset. Uh, the crime rate here in our city has its own, in, over the entire world, has skyrocketed. Arthur, Arthur Brown would be an asset of crime prevention, victim prevention. We have discussed this just numerous times during our visit of 40 years, that he has to... He's going to be his brother's keepers. He's going to have a voice to be able to communicate and connect with the real life experience with young people in a direction that he can express to them from firsthand uh, experience that he will be his brother's keepers. We are going to be a victim prevention. We're pushing. That's what we are going to do in our city, in our state and in this country. Arthur will be an asset to this state by every means necessary. All right. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, Arthur, would you like to make a statement on your behalf? Yes, I would. Um, I think back to 
when the crime occurred, there was no plan to rob, snatch a purse, get money for gas, uh, definitely not to kidnap or kill, uh, kill a person when unfortunate through making that bad decision to want to try to get some money, get some gas to put in the vehicle. Uh, those things did occur. And my relationship with God over 40 years has just been the source of my source of my rehabilitation and with that i've learned the importance of having that relationship and that relationship has enabled me to see the importance of myself and more importantly that enabled me to see the importance of every other human being so it's that angle that i live the rest of my life for is respecting people helping people and doing good about people all right thank you is the panel prepared to vote yes it's Mr. Mr. Roche. Mr. Brown, I know you have some fears this morning because you remember the vote on Parton Day, do you not? Yes, sir. And your vote was four to one. Am I correct? Yes, sir. And that you, the person that denied you, denied you based upon the Victim opposition that was displayed at your pardon hearing. Do you remember that? Yes, sir. Now, I'm going to tell you, Mr. Brown, the family of Charles L. Moss is still traumatized 40 years later. They lost a loved one, they lost a person that was a great winner. They lost everything when they lost Charles Moss. And they are still traumatized. The wife, the sisters, uh, and, and nieces and nephews. And I, in this decision, will take into consideration all you've done because you have performed very well during the incarceration, but I must take in consideration the victim and the, the victim's family that are still mentally, physically, and emotionally affected by your crime. So my vote today is a little different than the partner. My vote is to grant your early release under the following conditions. First condition is that you have a curfew from 9 p.m. to 6 a.m. You must attend at least three NAAA meetings a week. And you must perform community service five hours a month. Those are your general conditions under your supervision. A few from nine to six and eight meetings three times a week, community service five hours a month. These are special conditions under your role supervision. You are to have no contact with the victim's family. You are to have no contact with the victim's family. Your initial transition plan is with the parole project. But your permanent residency plan, and it's, this is mandated and required that it be south of East and West Louisiana Parish. You cannot have any residence plan that is north of East and West Louisiana Parish. That eliminates one second out, and I'll tell you the parish is one second. That eliminates ever living in Vernon, Rapids, and Evolved Parish in any parish north of those three parishes. Do you understand? Yes, sir. 
Next condition. You are forbidden or prohibited from entering the following parishes. Bienville, Bossier, Cato, DeSoto, Red River, and Webster Parish for the duration of your supervision. Majority of the victim's family lives in Bossier or Cato Parish. You are forbidden those two parish and any parish that's adjacent to those boundaries. So I'm gonna repeat those parishes and you will receive this in writing. Bienville, Bossier, Cato, DeSoto, Red River, and Webster Parish. Do you understand? Yes, sir. If you have to go to Texas, or if you have to go to Arkansas, you must enter to another parish within the state of Louisiana. The last condition, and we're going to supply the monitoring from parole and probation, you are to have electronic monitoring for the first five years of your relief. Do you understand those conditions? Yes, sir. Good luck, sir. Right. Mr. Freeman? Uh, I concur with Mr. Roger uh, with the same condition. All right, Steve, I'm to grant also to vote to grant your parole today with the same, uh, same stipulations as stated, same condition. Three votes to grant today. Your parole has been granted. Good luck to you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Right, so this we can actually unpack a little bit because I do have the appeal and details of what happened in this case. So those of you already, many of you do already know, but this was a parole hearing after a commutation hearing, which happened last year in June before I was doing these recordings. So I didn't have that commutation hearing. And that means that a commutation hearing, he had a life sentence without the possibility of parole. He had a hearing where there would have been uh, five uh, members of the uh, Parole Computation and Pardons Board, and he, he would have needed at least four to approve him. And in that hearing, they go through all of the details that we're accustomed to. They go through what did he do that day, they go through the questions, they go through, um, it's usually much more intensive. Uh, they didn't do that today, right? If the governor signs off on it, which the governor did, then you have the parole hearing, which is 90% of the time more routine. We didn't see them go through the questions. I believe we saw the victim there, but they didn't want to make a statement or didn't make a statement. And we have seen a few. There's one case that, that the, the person was denied that I can remember. And we have seen a few where the, the parole hearings have really followed through more like a commutation hearing, but for the most part, not. And that's why we saw what we saw today. Now, this was a senseless, ridiculous crime. And I, I did not like how, I mean, even in his final words, he said, I didn't intend for it to go that way. And it's such a violent crime that him even saying that all these years later, it, it boggles my mind. It's just like it feels again like you're rubbing salt in the wound in, in an open wound of a of the Vic. So, on the evening of March 26, 1983, if you can imagine that, Charles Moss left his home in North Streetport to have to have a prescription filled for his sick wife. After having done so, he stopped at Wendy's Drive-in Restaurant on North Market Street. While there, he was abducted by the defendant. Arthur Lee Brown and two conspirators, Terrell Porter and Gregory Means. The three conspirators drove Moss to a secluded area and proceeded to rob him at gunpoint for $5. 
five bucks. Now, 1993, I don't know. What was that? Were $30? Like, okay. He attempted to escape. And in the struggle, the gun discharged, striking Porter in the shoulder. Nevertheless, Porter and Brown succeeded in subduing Moss. Moss, uh, Oh, what's interesting, it, it's the gun discharged and hit Porter, which is not the victim. So he somehow got the gun to discharge on, on one of his attackers, hitting him in the shoulder. I still don't know what to do about this coloring. It just it feels so, I need to buy more lights maybe, I, I don't know. The lights are coming at me like like they're blinding me, but it doesn't look that great in the stream. Uh, so they subdued him. Moss was then stabbed by Porter. So Porter's pissed off, right? Porter's shot in the shoulder. He's mad, and he stabs him 35 times. Not once, not twice, not 10, not 20, not 30. 35 so he's in a full outrage you shot me that's it and who knows if he shot him or just in the struggle of um, anything could have happened right can you imagine the terror you just go out to get your wife medicine then you can you're in the drive through and these three guys show up they take your five bucks that you have you'll have five dollars on you and then you realize something's up, so you try to escape, and and then you know who knows the morons probably shot themselves, and uh, and then and and then they just go at you. Meanwhile, your wife is waiting. No cell phones. No, she just would have waited, not knowing. Sick. His body weighted down with the cement. Okay, so then uh, approximately 35 tons of the hunting knife. His body weighted down with cement blocks and dumped into a nearby pond. Brown was stabbed during the altercation. Moss, Brown was stabbed during the altercation. Moss automobile was then burned almost beyond recognition. Shortly afterward, members of the Shreveport Police Department responded to a shooting and stabbing call. Uh, there, the police discovered Brown and Porter who were injured. The police were informed that their injuries were sustained in a dice game because now, you know, they stabbed themselves in the frenzy. They shot themselves. They're a huge mess, all for five bucks. And now they tell the police that it happened in a dice game. Police officers noted a great deal of blood on the sidewalk and inside the automobile in which Brown, Porter, and Means had ridden to the Myrtle Street address. The police acquired the 603 consent of the of the declared owner of the vehicle, Miss Guy Booty. Well, that's the last name. To a search of the interior of the vehicle. At the request of the officers, Miss Booty opened up the trunk for them to search. The search produced a pair of men's Western cowboy boots, Western style straw hat with a large feather band and a blood stained hunting knife. You would have think, thought it was Davy Crockett's uh, stash over there. There was a fresh blood on the hat, boots, and knife. Miss Booty denied knowledge of these items. And just can you imagine opening that up? I don't know. And then it's like this is Davy Crockett's stuff is in your trunk. Miss Booty denied knowledge of these items and disclaimed any ownership of them. She stayed there or not when she loaned the automobile to the appellant earlier in the evening. They weren't there when I gave it to him. Two days later, Shreveport police detectives traded information pertaining to the shooting and stabbing incident with other detectives who are working with the missing persons. They're like, huh, oh, maybe uh, something happened over here. Maybe something happened over here. They figured it out basically. And on April 14, 1983, they indicted them. And uh, uh, 
Then they go through the different details. And on September 1983, uh, the jury unanimously convicted the appellant of the first degree charges. So, I mean, to his credit, he's not the one. It doesn't seem that, you know, had pulled the trigger. He's not the one that did the stabbing. You know, he probably really did think that they were just going to go rob him and and leave and things got out of hand. That's that's to his credit. But it, just to clarify, it, he's not the man that stabbed him 35 times. Like, imagine if he was. <laughs> I'd be raging right now. So maybe that's what he meant in his final speech. He really didn't intend to. He just he thought it'd be a quick hit. The guy's buying sandwiches, five bucks. I don't know why they just didn't take the five bucks, though. They have to go into his car. But still, you're involved with it, man. And uh, to think to watch your friend do that to someone else. But I don't know. How do you feel about it? Do you feel that someone after 40 years should get out if they were involved in the crime that did that but did not actually do it? They go through all the different appeal factors. We won't go through those in detail. So I just don't know how many of you are into going through all of it. We'll do uh, one more hearing and then we'll wrap up this. This... Uh, Snake. Hold on one second. Just a little bit of a little bit of a Uh, the committee on parole is reconvening. Time is 11.58 a.m. Uh, would the offender please give your full name and your Department of Corrections ID? Walter Wilson, 99586. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. My name is Alvin Roche. Uh, to my left is Mr. Pete Freeman and Ms. Jackson. Ms. Maya Jackson will be back momentarily. Uh, we're here for a parole hearing. Um, Mr. Jackson, I'm going to explain the process and then we're going to inter interview the persons uh, in, in support of your early release. Uh, our recent information is a record. Once that information is a record, we'll conduct a parole interview with you. At the appropriate time, we allow your supporters to make statements. Mr. Karen Myers uh, will not be speaking, but he's here for the uh, parole project. Mr. Andrew Huntley is here by Zoom, and he will be speaking in behalf of the Louisiana Parole Project. Uh, and I see you have some guests at Louisiana State. For those guests, please introduce yourself, starting with a young man, in the gray shirt. My name is Reginald Carolina. In your relationship to the offender? Uh, he's my uncle. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Good morning. My name is Sophia McDonald. I am Mr. Wilson's attorney from the Equal Justice Initiative. This is McDonald, but I want the uh, guest to introduce himself. My name is Catherine Wilson. I'm a sister. Okay. And the other young lady is with you, right, Ms. McDonald? Yes, sir. My name is Kit McGuire, and I'm an attorney. Okay. And you represent the Equal Justice System? The Equal Justice Initiative. <laughs> okay. Uh, would you like to close out the hearing, Ms. McDonald? Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Mr. Wilson, uh, you're currently 59 years old, is that correct? Yes, sir. 
Yes, sir. Okay. And you're a first felony offender, and you've been eligible for parole for the last six years. Am I correct? Yes, sir. And your parole date was uh, July 20th, 2017. Uh, your offense is aggravated rape, and your conviction date was August 20th, uh, 1982, and you were sentenced to life uh, without benefit of probation, parole, or suspension in sentence. You were resentenced uh, sometime in 2017. I, Suppose and you were resentenced to life with benefit because of your age at the time you committed the offense, you are considered a juvenile life. Is that correct? Yes, sir. So, Mr. Wilson, your, your case has been assigned to me. And this idea you can help me with this. I see a parole investigation report dated. 2017. Your first parole was in 2017. You were denied. You need a parole hearing. Is that correct? Yes, sir. You were denied. So you're up for a rehearing today. Yes, sir. So, first, Mr. Wilson, tell me the programs. You've completed while you're incarcerated. I've completed risk management, thinking for a change. I'm I'm currently in thinking for a change. So I completed okay. risk management, substance abuse, uh it, I have to refer to change okay. so it's a while. I've read your files, I know that you You've done extensive programming, but I want to know why it took you. As you can see, there's like lagging issues and um, this doesn't have to do with, with me. It's just the way that it played out. So hang in there with me. I'm sorry. Um, hopefully it, it, it does get better. Four or five years to complete your sex offender. You started in 2013 or 2014, and you did this phase for 2018. Why did it so long to complete the six of the degree? Because every time you move, move to different camps. Okay. You want to add that? So I have to wait to get back in. Okay, so so to all the previous program. Yes, sir. And was now I see where the victim has been unopposed here since twenty thirteen. She responded in that twenty thirteen investigation. And she was unopposed. She responded in 2015 and 2020, and said time she would not respond, but she was still opposed. She wanted us to refer back to the 2020 statement that she made. And she has consistently been unopposed to your early release. I want to put that on the record. We have minor uh, opposition from the DA's office in East Baton Rouge Parish 
and some of the law enforcement agencies in West Bay, in East Baton Rouge Parish. Uh, so the East Baton Rouge Parish officials have, have a moderate opposition. It's not a strong opposition. But more important, the victim of this crime, I think if there was Mars, is consistently unopposed to the early release. And I'm going to take that under very serious consideration. You have been incarcerated, under my estimation, 43 years as of this year. Am I correct? Yes, sir. So tell us what your work assignment is now. Uh, Mr. Wilson. I work in, in culinary as a baker's helper. How long have you been baking goods at Angola? It's been over a good period, about 10 years or so. So you've had the same job? For no, I just, I just recently got back in the kitchen. Okay, okay. I was, oh. I was a uh, dorm only for six years. Okay. When was your last disciplinary write up? Back in 2016. And what was that for? Mojo. Mojo. Do you know exactly what's in Mojo? No, sir. Nobody does. <laughs> Synthetic marijuana. Just a year ago, or maybe a year and a half ago, two of your fellow offenders met death with Mojo. You are aware of that, right? Yes, sir. Have you taken any substance abuse treatment since the writer for Mojo? No, sir. I, I tried getting in, but they say by me already taking it. Once before through 100 hours and substance abuse already, I couldn't get back in. Okay. Just one and two. Okay. Be very, be very honest with me, uh, Mr. Wilson. Do you have a substance abuse? Well, I got I've been working on. And that's all I need? No. You do have a substance abuse problem. And I would be derelict in my duty if I were release you without giving the help. Through, through my attorneys and through the parole project, I'll be getting help. Well, I know, but I want to get you help before you're released. I know Thank the you. parole project will do a fantastic job. But it is my duty to give you as many tools as possible so that you can be successful when you release. Now, I'm going to give Mr. Huntley a chance to tell me exactly what he has planned for you upon release. But I am. almost positive that I think that you are ready to be released all except for the substance abuse issue. You served 43 years. The victim of your crime is unopposed. You have good programs. I will give one foul give me his remarks, and then we'll make some decisions. One foul Yes, sir. Um, Walter, since his incorporation here, part of his uh, time frame of completing his his sex offender treatment was um, when when as a subsequent of his write up, he would be moved into a cell block area, and at that time, that programming was not available in the cell block areas. Um, his last write-up was in 16. 
Since then, he has worked his way through field lines. Um, he has been uh, a janitor on the East Shore from 17, three of 17 until just recently, he moved uh, June of this year back into culinary. So he's worked himself back up to where he was. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, Warren. Tell us about your, I know what your initial transition plan is, but tell me what your transition plan is after leaving Louisiana Parole Project. Well, I'll be staying with my sister and I'll be gone by them having a, the program set up for me. I'll be gone now from nine to five and they'll get me a job. And basically I'll be in their hands for a while, and then I have my lawyers at EGI, and I have my sister and my nephew. So I have people around me that help me through my transition period. Your sister lives in Baton Rouge, right? Yes, sir. Okay. And what program are you talking about? AA and NA. Well, before NA, NA, we got to get you some Bonafide substance abuse treatment. Uh, Mr. Huntley, would you chime in, please? Sure. Thank you, Mr. Roche. Uh, Andrew Huntley uh, with Louisiana Parole Project. I'm here, uh, appearing before the board today to confirm that if Walter's granted release, uh, he will be a client of our reentry program. To clarify, this is our first appearance as an organization uh, on behalf of Walter. Uh, I'd ask the board, don't read into it that we, as an organization, we didn't take a, any position on him in any of his previous parole hearings. As you're aware, uh, Walter's a, a, a Graham lifer. There are some additional, you know, um, considerations when it comes to someone who's a Graham lifer. Our organization over the last few years has had significant increase in our capacity. Uh, so we're able to provide, uh, you know, more support to Graham lifers in, in consideration with the registration issues. So if Walter were to be released, he would uh, come into our housing program immediately and Walter would live with us until a point where, uh, you know, he completes uh, the first couple phases of our program and we felt comfortable that there could be a handover. We don't want to put a, a time on that yet, but you know, one of the things in particular is we want to ensure that Walter uh, is stable, uh, that we're comfortable with his, you know, the, the progress that he's made on his sobriety plan, um, among other things, until the point that he would move on uh, to live with his family. Uh, of course, we would work with the Office of Probation and Parole to ensure that you know, an address is approvable before he goes from our program uh, to living, uh, you know, with family. But of course, he would still be in Baton Rouge and, and would have really close access to our staff. Uh, if Walter's released, he would uh, have a substance abuse and a mental health evaluation that takes place uh, in addition to whatever requirements that this board would, would place on him, our, our staff social worker and our reentry staff would also potentially add additional requirements as it would relate to those evaluations. We're going to ensure that he has access not only to our staff social worker, but he has access to the resources in the community. So he, he remains sober and he has, you know, his issues addressed. I think that, you know, uh, maybe a little differently from uh, a, a juvenile lifer you saw earlier today, I think uh, Walter's Maturity and growth is very clear, especially over the last seven years. Our organization has a great deal of confidence in him, and he's right at the age of 60. He, he's still able to work. Uh, we have confidence that we can help him at this point uh, find employment where he can start to earn, uh, whereas in a few years he, he may not have uh, the opportunity to, to do that, and I'll let his attorney say more about that. 
But all in all, our organization commits to provide housing to Walter, intermediate housing until the point that we're confident that he's on the right path, that uh, he's following all of the recommendations that the board makes as it relates to his priority. Mr. Roche, just based on you know the path of the program, I know Walter has indicated he's in T for C. He he wants to complete that program, uh, and and I believe that the board will probably make a recommendation uh, related to other substance abuse treatment <laughs> based on Walter's age and the amount of time he spent at Angola. I would recommend that a treatment program. There's some really good programs at Louisiana State Penitentiary. I would recommend that a program that exists there would be better for Walter than, say, a Steve Hoyle. Uh, nothing against Steve Hoyle, but Steve Hoyle is a young man's program. And I found that especially people who've been at Angola for decades, uh, moving them to that environment isn't always a good thing. And it could cause people to experience some hardships. So I would only ask the board any additional programs that you may recommend. I would ask you to consider those that exist in Angola and allow parole project then to ensure that follow-up uh, is completed in the community from there. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Huntley. Warren Falco. Yes, sir. Which program at Louisiana State Penitentiary would be suited best for Mr. Wilson? You probably get him into the STAR, pro star program. The STAR program? Yes, sir. Now, I also want to inquire. Mr. Wilson told me his last disciplinary write up was in 2016 for intoxication and contraband. I also see a write up in May of 2021 for aggravated work offense and June of 2021 for an aggravated work offense. Is that on your records? That is not on my record. Um, as far as looking at his conduct report, conduct I report right up 100 was on May 24, 2021. He had a disciplinary hearing on May 25th, and he received 14 days of canteen and 12 weeks of deduction from earnings and Roche, I, I'm they, they're redacted in my in my uh in my record here so evidently they expunged administratively for some okay, reason they, they said that's the wrong records yes okay okay no problem no problem they're not redacted uh uh noted expunged on my record they are here in his original. Yeah. And that's good enough for me. All right. Uh, so what program do you suggest, Warden? The STAR program, okay. Yes, sir. Mr. Freeman, any questions? No, sir. Mr. Jackson, any questions? Okay, uh, at this time, uh, one second. So that's the only speaker we have. So, Mr. Wilson, would you like to? Hear? Okay, I don't have you speaking, but Caroline. Caroline. Okay. That's what I needed right here. Okay. Um. Uh, first of all, Mr. Mr. Carolina, the. Man, remember, you said a nephew. Would you please yes, give sir. us a statement? Yes, sir. My name is Reginald Carolina. Uh, almost 33 with three years with Louisiana State Police Radio Communication. I'm uh, Walters Wilson's nephew. Uh, just wanted to speak on his behalf for the third time. I'm not sure what more I, I could say, but I just wanted to at least address the board, and I appreciate you giving me an opportunity to address it. Uh, I have seen uh, quite a bit of change throughout the years. And my uncle, of course, uh, we've had quite a bit of tragedy since his first parole hearing. 
but I've seen that obviously the maturity is is there. He's uh, implementing the programs that he's been a part of, and he has maintained uh, his sobriety since that incident in 2016, despite the many things that happened. Lost one of my uncles, uh, two aunts that been in the hospital, uh, another aunt that had an aneurysm. He knows all of these things, but he, he maintained his sobriety. Uh, I think that speaks well to the programs that he's been a part of. Uh, some voluntarily, some, you know, ordered by the first parole hearing. He completed those things. Uh, I think uh, with the opportunity to come back out, into society, I think with, with the family being as it is, uh, we can help him to, to uh, transition into his new life uh, with an opportunity to be a productive citizen. Thank you, boy, for listening to my word. Thank you, Mr. Caroline. I try to so free of my God. Thank you for the opportunity to speak on Mr. Wilson's behalf. I'm with the Equal Justice Initiative and we have represented Mr. Wilson for over 12 years. This is his third time before this honorable committee. No one disputes the seriousness and the gravity of Mr. Wilson's offense in 1980 at age 16 when he harmed an innocent victim. In doing so, he harmed the victim, her family, and the entire community, and he takes full responsibility for his actions. Today at 59, Mr. Wilson is a completely different person. He has matured into a deeply remorseful man who has dedicated his adult life to his rehabilitation. Mr. Wilson's demonstrated rehabilitation over 43 years makes him exactly the type of person the United States Supreme Court had in mind when it required that juvenile non-homicide offenders be given a meaningful opportunity to obtain release. Um, he has spent decades reflecting on his crime and participating in programming at Angola to better himself. At his second parole hearing in 2020, where he received two votes to grant, this board recognized his commitment to self-improvement. Years before Granby, Florida came down, years before Mr. Wilson had any hope of the possibility of release, he obtained his GED, he committed to his faith, enrolling in multiple religious programs, and took advantage of other positive programs that were offered at the prison. He has completed all four phases of risk management, including phase four, which qualifies him to be a peer facilitator, and he actually did facilitate the course for some time. Um, he has taken substance abuse programs, anger management, the 100 hour reentry preparation program. And as we've discussed, he's almost finished with thinking for a change. And he also is in yet another victim awareness program because he wants to better understand the harm that he inflicted. Mr. Wilson has worked steadfastly as you've seen in a number of jobs in the prison, including as a baker's assistant, an orderly, a nurse's aide. He's also worked in the vegetable processing plant. Um, Mr. Wilson recognizes that alcohol and drugs were a destructive force in his life and his number one focus has to be his sobriety. Um, he has completed some substance abuse programming here and he's committed to enrolling um, in further substance abuse treatment and support groups with the assistance of the Louisiana Parole Project if granted parole. In 2016, after nearly a decade of sobriety, Mr. Wilson used drugs when his sister had a serious stroke. Since then, Mr. Wilson has rededicated himself to his sobriety and has stayed sober, sober for almost 10 years. He has cultivated and learned tools to manage stressful situations and has not resorted to alcohol or drugs, um, despite a number of challenging moments that Mr. Carolina just laid out, the hospitalization of his sister again, the death of his brother, two parole denials. Mr. Wilson's home plan is with the Louisiana Parole Project and Andrew Hundley laid out the services that they'll provide, but they're providing long-term wraparound services to Mr. Wilson to make sure he meets all parole requirements and is successful if granted parole. And of course, Mr. Wilson will also have the continued support of the Equal Justice Initiative. Um, to conclude, 
Mr. Wilson caused immense harm to a victim over 43 years ago when he was just a child, but he committed his life to rehabilitation and being a better man long before he had the hope of ever being able to be released. And I think his record speaks volumes about his growth, his maturity, his rehabilitation, and his remorse. In Graham v. Florida, the U.S. Supreme Court granted a special opportunity to people like Mr. Wilson, who were children at the time of their non-homicide offense, holding that someone like him is entitled to the opportunity for release and that full circumstances of the offender should be considered. So today, we respectfully ask this board to consider all of those factors and grant parole pursuant to any conditions deemed appropriate by the board. Thank you. Ms. McDonald, Attorney McDonald, thank you. And thank you to the Equal Justice Initiative for your diligence and longtime support of Mr. Wilson. Thank you, uh, Mr. Is the panel ready to vote? Mr. Wilson, you've been incarcerated for 43 years. Floyd Falgu has given very positive remarks. You've made strides since 2016 when you had some family issues and you resolve to grow, but I want to give you as much ammunition as possible. So I'm going to grant your early release upon completion of Thinking for a Change in the STAR program. Okay, the STAR program doesn't have a time limit. Each individual finishes or completes that program at his own pace. And the officials at the Louisiana State Penitentiary will decide when you have completed that program. But upon completion of the STAR program and taking for change, you will be released. And you'll be released to the Louisiana Parole Project. Upon release, I want you to first follow all recommendations of the STAR program. And that involves libertal shots at intervals, but it will be your decision whether or not you will partake in that part of the program. It's, it's, it's a volunteer part of the STAR program. We cannot mandate date that you take the river to our shot. But if it is in your best interest, I want you to consider it. After that, follow all recommendations of the STAR program. I want you to go to at least three NAA -A -A meetings a week. And I want you to have a curfew from 9 p.m. to 6 a.m. Good luck. Mrs. Jackson. All right, Ms. Wilson, my vote is the same. Uh, conditionally grant upon completion of the STAR program and thinking for a change. Mr. Freeman? Uh, I concur with my colleagues. The only condition I would like to add is that you stay away from the victim. Okay. Okay. Mr. Wilson? You have been conditionally granted based upon your completion of thinking for a change in the STAR program. The following conditions apply after release. We must follow all recommendations of the STAR program, curfew from nine to six, three NAAA meetings a week, and no contact with the victims. Your early release is you have a good day. Thank you, sir, and bold members. Thank you.